always a happy day when Amazon delivers a package. And what do we get? More reading material. Hey, what is up, Internet? This is Kyla Slapshot Toys doing issue number one of the pool list. Um, and actually, let me tell you guys a little secret if you guys want to come here real quick. Um, this actually isn't the first issue of the pool list. I uh, actually did a couple videos, uh, probably when I started the channel about a year ago. Really crappy. Uh, before I got over my anxiety of being on camera and putting it out for the world. So they're really bad. Uh, so I'm not going to count those. And Marvel renumbers their books all the time anyway, right? So this is number one. So this is the first issue of the pool list. Welcome. Really glad you guys are checking out these videos. I think it's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, like I said, my preview number zero issue. I'm just going to go over the books that I get each week and then feature a trade uh, of some sort at the end. I know normally when Marvel and all of them do a uh, number one issue, it's this huge, oversized, six, seven, eight dollar book. Fortunately, I didn't do great planning when I decided to start this video series this week. So it's only, I think, three books and a trade. But yeah, so no, no big fireworks, anything super crazy. Uh, nothing big plan like that. Uh, but like I said, for this week, we do have three books. First up from DC, we have Detective Comics 962. Marvel Comics, we have Amazing Spider-Man number 31. Image Comics, we have Redlands number one. And the feature trade also from Image Comics, AD After Death. First up, we're going to talk about Detective Comics 962. Now, this book is written by James Tynan IV with art by Alvaro Martinez. Now, if you guys haven't been reading Detective Comics, it's essentially turned into a bat team book. Uh, kind of taking the Avengers kind of model and taking it to the bat. So the team members include Batman, of course, Batwoman, Red Robin, Playface of all, which is kind of cool, really. Orphan, spoiler, and I think that's it. Oh, I... Duh, Azrael or Azrael. The whole arc centers around Azrael. Of course, he's on the team. But basically, it's just been Batman, Batman and Batwoman training these younger heroes in Gotham to kind of take over once those two are gone. And this one actually centers around Azrael. Basically, the Order of Saint Dumas has sent another AI suit uh, assassin, if you will, to cleanse Gotham and to take Azrael out. And it's the Bat team basically coming together along with Zantana to get rid of the threat. Pretty simple. Uh, pretty sure it's simple, straightforward arc. Uh, this is the final issue of the arc, so this is really kind of your action-packed. Everything that's been building up kind of explodes into an action-packed fighting scene. Even with all the action and all the fighting, Tynan does a really good job pushing the story forward as these kind of really action-packed scenes are happening. There's a couple of themes in here, especially kind of dealing with the Order of St. Dumas of how we can sometimes look so one-sided at things. And uh, as the assassin sent here to kill Azrael, um, it's kind of so hellbent, if you will, on the purification of Gotham uh, that they miss, you know, some of, maybe some of the other truths out there because they're so focused on this one goal. I really kind of like how uh, Tynan put that in there, um, even as this big battle is going on. I thought that was really cool, kind of taking that away from. And Azrael is kind of always a character I've really kind of liked because of that kind of infliction uh, and haunting uh, that's always been inside him. So I thought that was really cool. Uh, and it's kind of cool to see this arc really focus on Azrael. So like I said, it's an ending issue. So, you know, there's a big battle, a lot of fighting, just your typical kind of everything's built up. Now nah, just let it, let, let the pipe burst, if you will. The art overall is fantastic, as you can kind of see here. There's some, oh, sorry. There's some really, really good, cool, like kind of almost like nightmare type scenes in this. Uh, overall, I really enjoyed the art. I thought they especially like the Azrael suit. Um, the detail and everything is is just fantastic. So this was a really good arc. Uh, like I said, it kind of sucks that I'm starting this series right at the end of an arc, so I can't kind of walk through a whole arc for you. But that was kind of my thoughts on Detective Batman. Really good run so far. If you're not reading it, definitely pick it up. There's a huge, huge, I'm not going to go into any spoilers, but there's a huge twist at the end that I can't wait to see where it goes. So I'm really, really, really freaking excited uh, to see where this book goes. So if you're not reading Detective Batman, this is a perfect jumping on point. I think, I don't know, I think they're like uh, 20 or so issues in. So if you want to try to find all the back issues, I'm sure you can at a local comic book shop. But it's definitely a series worth picking up. And there's definitely a fantastic conclusion to an arc. I'm super happy I'm into this book. Next up from Marvel Comics, Amazing Spider-Man number 31. Once again, with absolutely no thought, this is another ending of an arc. If you guys haven't been reading Spider-Man, uh, this actually has been a long time coming. I kind of got to fill you guys in a little bit of the gaps. I don't know if you guys remember, but back when Dan Slott originally took over Spider-Man, they changed it from Amazing to Superior. And it actually was 
Dr. Octavius, Doc Ock, puts his brain, or his brain basically, in Peter Parker's body and becomes Spider-Man for that entire arc. Now, once they actually ended that run and Dan Slott took over and they renamed it Amazing Spider-Man, they put Parker back in his own body, but Octavius's memory was then put into this giant robot called the Living Brain, and Dan Slott essentially then turned Spider-Man into a very much Tony S type character, built this huge technological company, uh, or techno uh, built this huge technology company called Parker Industries. It was making like all sorts of smartphones, almost kind of like Apple basically, but it was all, but it was built through the help of this giant robot called the Living Brain. Uh, the last arc, well not really arc, they did a little Spider-Man event called the Clone Conspiracy, which was okay, not great, but that's besides the point where Jackal was basically using clones to bring people back from the dead. Uh, it's called the New You Program, and throughout all this, uh, the Living Brain reveals himself to be Dr. Octavius, and then gets one of the clone bodies, takes this clone body, and then becomes Superior Octopus, and is now working for Hydra for the new Marvel event, Secret Empire. But this was the final issue of this arc where Superior Octopus is basically trying to take back, since he feels that as the Living Brain, he helped, or basically he built Parker Industries. So he feels that that is all, basically all the money, all the technology, all the power belongs to him. So his whole goal is to get all that back from Peter Parker and Spider-Man. And like I said, Spider-Man is now pretty much an Iron Man type character, billionaire, runs his own company, has an, has, as you saw in the movie, has a suit that has all sorts of different type of webs in it. All sorts of stuff, which I really didn't mind all the webs and the technology in the suit. I didn't like the AI in the movie. I thought that was I thought that was a little bit much. He doesn't necessarily have an AI in the books. I thought the movie, I was like, it takes away everything from the spider sense. I really didn't like the AI in the movie. I didn't mind the different types of web shooters and all that type of stuff. Because I feel like there's an natural progression in our day of technology and things like that. So I was completely cool with that. Because uh, it's very book accurate for what Dan Slott's doing right now. Yeah, we essentially turned him into Tony Stark. Which is okay. It's not my favorite thing to do to Peter in the book, but it is what it is. Slot's gonna write it how he wants. He's been writing Spider-Man for I think nine years. You're not gonna change his mind on what he wants to do. Uh, you just gotta go with it, and I I enjoy it for the most part. So yeah, so <laughs> completely off base there, but uh, so yeah, so Octopus is trying to basically reclaim Parker Industries for himself. Uh, Peter's doing everything he can not to let that happen. Once again, this is the final issue, so we get a lot of action. Uh, the battle scene is fantastic. I really, 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 really like... I actually felt kind of, I don't know, excited reading this book. Uh, it really got kind of the energy uh, going. So I actually really enjoyed this issue. It, like I said, it's mainly a fight scene, uh, but the slot definitely put in a lot of little twists. I don't, I don't really want to get into spoilers. I mean, I really want to get into spoilers, but if you haven't read the book yet, I don't really want to ruin it. But he just, he, the way he ends the arc is, I think it's fantastic. I really, really enjoyed just kind of how all the pieces fell into place. Uh, it's just, it was just a really, really good issue. I think this is probably the most I have enjoyed an Amazing Spider-Man issue in quite some time. I'm very intrigued into where Dan Slott is going to take this. Because I really do think Dan Slott is a fantastic writer. I really enjoyed a lot of the Amazing Spider-Man run. I just think that there are little bits and pieces here that he's added that I just don't think are necessary. But, so I like, I'm really, really excited with what he's done here. I want to talk about it so bad, but I can't because I don't want to ruin it. Uh, but yeah, the, and then Stuart, Emmer, Stuart Inman, the artist, phenomenal. If I'm ever able to get an original page uh, from this amazing Spider-Man run, oh, I'm going to do it in a heartbeat. His, his work is absolutely gorgeous. Just to give you a little example of his work right there. I mean, absolutely, yeah. He, uh, Stuart Inman is one, probably one of my favorite Spider-Man artists currently. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, so I'm really curious to see what Marvel's going to do with that, where Dan's going to take this. So this is the perfect jumping on point. Uh, if you have any interest since in seeing the Spider-Man Homecoming, if you have any interest in the Amazing Spider-Man series, this is definitely the time to jump on. Next up from Image Comics, we're gonna take a look at Redlands number one. Now Redlands is a new horror comic from Jordi Belair and Vanessa Del Rey. They are absolutely fantastic people. I got to meet uh, Jordi Belair at C2E2 and she was wonderful. Now she's primary, pri I can't talk. I really suck at talking. Primarily a colorist. Uh, she's done a lot of work on Batman 
Uh, actually, that's what I went to see to E2 when I met her. Uh, she also does the colors on Images Injection. Uh, but yeah, that's actually what I when I got to meet her at C2E2, I was having her sign some Batman books. But this is her new creator-owned horror comic, and it's phenomenal. Absolutely love this book. Now, uh, full disclosure, I am a big horror comic fan. Uh, a lot of my a lot of my favorite image titles kind of I would say fall into the horror monster kind of subgenre, if you will. And this one is fantastic, especially for a brand new opening series. Uh, I was hooked from the first page. So basically, giving an overview, this, this thing is 1977, a uh, small little rural town, uh, and there's basically gone a witch, a witch lynching slash burning has gone completely wrong. So it opens up to this fiery tree with three nooses hanging off of it. And then this, like right outside a police station, and then you cut right to inside the police station. There are just tons of cops all sitting there barricading doors, windows, just yelling at each other, where are they, where are they? So clearly something has went extremely wrong with this lynching. And then what takes place is just pure chaos. Uh, and these witches just absolutely, like, just enact their craziest revenge uh i'm super oh it's just it's, it's crazy like i i, I want to get more into it but i really don't want to get any spoilers or anything like that but it's oh it's it's, it's just crazy it's nothing but a flat out action-packed first issue there's not really a whole lot of story which i kind of like because it just gives you this like you're like what in the world's going on who are these witches what in the world have they done that these that the that these cops uh are wanting you know we're wanting to kill them uh and then, like, you know, like, what are their powers? I mean, like, you just see so many crazy things in this book. It's like, you, you want to know what the rules of the world are. And it's just, oh, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, and just sitting here thinking about it, it's, it's awesome. Now, like I said, the story is very is very thin in this one. Uh, it's essentially kind of getting their revenge. It doesn't, it doesn't explain anything. Like I said, it doesn't explain any of the rules of the world. It doesn't explain really any of their powers other than they can kind of shape shift it appears. But, yeah. I mean, there's so many unanswered questions, and I think that's the greatest thing about a number one comic is you make it so extremely entertaining, but yet, and you make it so intriguing, and that's what Jordi Belair or Jordi Belair, once again, man, I cannot talk today, uh, and Vanessa Del Rey have done. It's just, oh, it, it it's awesome. Like it just it hooks you, and you want to know more, and you and you, you. I've actually read this book twice just because I was like, this is this is awesome, and it's such a quick read. It took me like five minutes to read because like I said it's nothing but action. So I think that's probably the best thing you can say about a number one issue is it absolutely just hooks the reader, and that's what they've created here. They've created intrigue, suspense, just this whole world of wonderment, and threw in a lot of really awesome kind of gore. And then now the only um, issue I did kind of have with this book is a little bit in the art and it's a little bit sloppy. I think it fits the tone of the book very, very well. It's very gritty, very dark. The only issue is there's a couple panels where you think something's happening, but it's very hard to make out because the detail is very, like I said, very grainy. I don't want to use the word sloppy because that makes it sound bad, and it's not bad. I know it's the style that they were going for, so it's like one of those things. Like, it it, it just made the read. There's a couple there's a couple panels where I was just looking at it like, what exactly happened here? Uh, just because there wasn't a whole lot of detail. So that would be my only criticism criticism of the book, and I'm hoping that. But it also kind of played to the idea of all this chaos going around because these cops have no idea where these witches are at, what they're doing, anything like that. So it kind of played to the chaos, but there were a couple of scenes where I'm like, okay, which character was this? Just because the detailed faces and all that just weren't as detailed to really know who characters were and those type of things. But other than that, if you're a horror fan, if, you, if you're missing out, like I'm a huge Nailbiter fan and that series just ended, oh no, oh why did it have to end? But hopefully, maybe this will replace it. So if you're a huge horror fan like I am, make sure you pick up a copy of Redlands. I know it already sold out, so hopefully maybe some of the comic shops will still have it, but they're rushing it to a second print. So hopefully, if you weren't able to get the first uh, printing, you'll definitely get a second print. Now what I usually do with image uh, books is I buy the first one to see if it's something that would hook me, and then I'll wait for the trade. That's probably what I'll do with this one. So I'm sure once I actually get the full trade, I'll do the uh, review of that. But yeah, if you guys are looking for horror, make sure you pick up Redlands number one can't recommend it enough and now this brings us to our spotlight book uh this week i'm going to take a look at after death now this is an image comic book written by scott snyder along with art by jeff lemire now you guys are going to hear me talk a ton 
about these two. Uh, they are both actually two of my favorite authors in the comic world today. Jeff Lemire also does a lot of his own artwork. So he actually joined Scott um, as doing the art on this book. I, I don't think I have the words to tell you how amazingly just beautiful um, this book is. It, it's and not, and not just in an art sense. I mean, just in the the sense of the the themes that this book tackles, the way it's written, the chances that they take in writing it the way they did. Now the art's fantastic. Uh, Jeff Lemire absolutely knocked it out of the park, uh, especially fitting the tone of the book. But it's just, it's just, oh, it, it's a beautiful book. And not only that, but I mean, this is just a absolutely gorgeous. So this is a hardcover. Um, the issue was, or the series itself was only three issues long. It was a mini series. Now, each issue was a very big oversized issue. So it's probably more like six, seven issues if you thought about it in the normal comic sense. But this is just a gorgeous hardcover that Image has given us. I mean, that just, just that image there on the cover looks fantastic. Um, really nice stitch binding. It's just it's just a gorgeous book. Really nice thick cardstock uh, for the pages. It's just just a wonderful pre presentation of this story. Um, and if you actually can see, looking at it as your normal trade and comic book, it's actually an oversized book as well. So it really stands out on my shelf. Just I love it when Image and all all those other companies do just do these wonderful hardcovers. Um, it just it just makes the book feel that much special. But taking a closer look at the story, what we actually get is very much like a sci-fi um, comic mixed with a little bit of a kind of a look at a memoir or journal in a, in a lot of ways. But actually, the story starts in 1982. We meet our main character Jonah. He's actually on vacation with his family. Now it kind of makes it sound like his family is a little bit stressed really kind of needs a vacation, but they get down to Florida and it's raining every day. It wasn't the kind of escape that they needed. So on their last day, they're driving down the highway and they see this balloon fall. And the balloon actually has a phone number on it and it seems part of a contest. I think a school up in New York was trying to see basically how far a balloon would fly. And so whoever called and was the furthest away, they won a prize. So they called the number all excited and then they finally got hope. That they hear that their vacation was going to have a bright spot and then they call and find out the contest had ended a couple weeks ago in new jersey was the farthest but they're in florida and it just it just seems very the frustration takes over and it's like almost that hope was written or ripped away and then all of a sudden the mother just collapses and that's kind of a main theme of the book is almost like this kind of idea of how do we deal with how do we deal with it when like the hope that little that little s glimmer of hope is kind of ripped away from us and then it ends up that the mother ends up going through uh, all sorts of tests and everything they find out it's it was just like a little seizure uh, nothing to be worried about it should be fine so they go uh, a couple more times absolutely nothing nothing wrong find out that the mother's gonna be pregnant so our main character is gonna have a brother and then all of a sudden they find out that it wasn't something insignificant and it ends up claiming not only the mother's life, but her unborn child. And it was just absolutely heart-wrenching. And you can just feel the family kind of j just, like all the heartache just like collapse on them. And then that causes our main character, Jonah, to just kind of live this life of fear and anxiety over kind of just, just situations that he can't control. Um, just a major fear of death, a major fear of kind of just dangerous situations, those type of things. But the funny, but not the funny, but the, the thing is that then leads him to this life of being a master thief because he finds himself so kind of OCD, so zoned in on always trying to like find every situation that he can control, like whether it be entry points to a building or cameras or anything like that. So he becomes this phenomenal thief. And then as he becomes this phenomenal thief, he's actually approached by a, a, a man who's wanting to steal pretty much a child. Uh, now this actually really isn't a child. She actually has a genetic disease that then, that actually slows down her aging. Well, actually slows down aging of certain organs within her body. Uh, so things like hair, nails, all those types of things still age the exact same. So this girl's actually 40 years old, uh, pretty much weeks away from death, but she looks like she's four. And the way the book kind of describes it is it says uh, just genetic disease where certain organs age at the normal rate. Some of them almost basically stop. And then so this 
the the person who wants Jonah to basically kidnap this girl from her clinic she is at has this idea that he has a team of scientists that believe that they can actually extract the gene that causes this genetic disease and use it for a cure for death. So they end up using Jonah to steal this girl and then they find the cure for death, which is really kind of cool. Uh, you think about it, and that's very much where the sci-fi uh, starts. Uh, up until then, it's, it's, it's pretty much a, uh, a straightforward, just kind of introspective look at the Jonah's kind of fears and anxieties and those type of things. Um, and then this is where the definite sci-fi uh, part takes place. Uh, from there, we actually then find out that the, the facilitator of this whole thief is actually some music producer that's worth billions of dollars. And what he's actually done is already built this giant, almost kind of like city compound, if you will, up in the mountains. Uh, because this, once they do find the cure for death, they actually have to bring people to this compound and then they have to administer the, uh, the cure uh, several times. So they keep them there while they kind of see how they react, those type of things. And then they're free to go and come as they need, as they need the cure administered. But it actually turns out most people end up staying. And so we flash forward and I think we're like four or five, 600 years into the future. And basically the whole earth, as far as this compound knows, is just decimated. Uh, everything below the mountains is just like storms and just between war, just natural time, everything that they know is just absolutely demolished. And the only thing left is the city compound up in the hills where everybody lives forever. The book also then tells us that the memory, even though these people can live forever, the memory can only hold so much information, much a certain memory chip or something like that, that only has a certain amount of memory. So after a hundred years of roughly, the, all the previous memories start to erase. So it's almost like these people up in the up in the mountains just kind of keep reliving their lives over and over. They're still the same person because they're they're they can't die. They can yeah, so they so they keep reliving things over and over because they can't remember them after a certain amount of time. And it's kind of cool like the way that they describe the compound working is someone does a job for like 70 years and then they switch to another job. So they can't like so their careers always change. So they're not always doing the same type of thing, but they can't remember it. So they keep moving on from job to job to job. And one of the jobs is going to a station and listening for possibly any signs of life down below this electric kind of just mist uh, that surrounds, that's basically laying underneath this mountain. So basically all your clouds and everything like that. Our main character Jonah, his next job is to listen. And of course, what do you think happens? He hears something. Uh, and I don't wanna to get too much actually into what actually happens in the book or anything like that. But this is just an absolutely wonderfully beautiful book. So much so, um, I think that Scott Snyder and Jeff Lemire definitely took some major, 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 major chances in writing this. And one of the really cool things is, so like I was describing, so there's a whole part that takes place in now, from like basically 1982 until now, uh, with the thieving and finding the cure and those type of things. And it's really cool because that's actually written out in true prose, prose, uh, prouse. I, I know there's someone who actually reads and knows like the literature terms is screaming their head off at me right now. So let me know in the comments. I'm sorry that I don't know, but it's actually like the normal novelization form. So everything that happens in that time frame from 1982 to now is actually written in that form, much like a memoir, much like a journaling almost. Uh, so this book does take a lot of effort to read if you're only used to reading comic books. I have not read a book like this probably since college. So it was a little bit taken back, but I knew going into it, that's what Scott Snyder had done. So I kind of prepared myself. Uh, but it, if, you, if you're willing to put in the work, it's such a it's such a wonderful reward, and then so everything that happens in the future is actually the actual comic form, and that is absolutely gorgeous, illustrated by Jeff Lemire. Uh, I'd say probably about uh, two thirds is actually the book form. Uh, one third is probably the comic. There's not as much comic as there is the actual journaling. And as you can see here, Jeff Lemire's artwork is just absolutely phenomenal. I love his kind of color, um, his watercolor style that he has and it just it just gives the book just a wonderful kind of almost like dreamlike sequence to it and that's kind of how i feel like a lot of the book is just very much kind of very dreamlike it's just it's just fantastic
fantastic. We kind of taking a closer look at kind of what I've taken away from this book. As someone who deals with a lot of anxiety on a daily basis, uh, this book just really, really stuck with me. Uh, not to get too personal here, but this is one of those books that I read and it, I, I, I couldn't stop thinking about it. There were so many things in it that I took away from. One of the big things that the book really kind of describes is Jonah's describing kind of his anxiety, his fear of death, and just kind of just his general anxiety. And he describes it in a way of everybody is on a frozen lake. Everybody knows the lake is solid enough to hold everybody. So all your family, friends, everybody, everybody's been out there for hours and hours having a wonderful time. Everybody's sliding, playing hockey, doing everything they can on this ice. In the in Jonah's mind, he can't focus on the fun. He can't focus on on you know the the, the laughter, the the hockey game, everything like that. The only thing he can focus on is couple inches below that ice is that black water that black ice cold water and that was something that like as soon as I read it I was like that's a that I mean that, that that's exactly how I feel sometimes with this with an anxiety type thing and it was just it was just one of those books that the whole idea of Jonah as he is living this life over and over and over and over again that he finds out that he's starting to become complacent that he, he's, he's allowing this anxiety just to kind of overtake his everyday life and to the point where he's not doing anything special anymore, if that's, if that's the right word I'm looking for. But he's, he's not fully living his life. He's just so focused on how to control certain situations, uh, things that really can't be controlled, that, he's, that he, he's just not living his life at all. And then he finally realizes that's his biggest fear is not living life. It's not so much the, the fact that he's gonna, even even with with absolutely no thought of death, he's still fixated on that type of anxiety and those type of fears. And basically the whole book is, and from what I take it away from it, is Jonah really starting to fight to be able to claw his way out of that mindset. And, and for me, it was one of those things that I just, I kind of like, it, it really just struck with me now. Uh, and it's just, it's not to get, sorry to get really kind of personal there, but it was just such a beautiful book. It really connected me. And that's the reason I really wanted to do it for my first review is because I just thought it was such a wonderful read. And uh, like I said, Scott Snyder and Jeff Lemire are definitely two of my f absolute favorite artists, uh, artists, not artists, but authors, creators in the comic book world. And so I know it was a no brainer buying buying this book because it was those two. Not that I know that it was gonna be that impactful on me, but I was really happy that this was something that came out a couple weeks ago. So I was able to do it for my first review. Uh, now, if you're looking for like just a straightforward story, you might be a little bit uh, upset with the ending. It's very open-ended. It's very, it's very kind of up to the reader to decide what they're gonna take out of it. Like I said, I think the idea was more of Scott Snyder working through maybe some of his own anxieties, uh, his own kind of fear of death, if you will. And I think that's kind of more of what the book was about, more than like actually telling, like, you know, like a, a, a hero story, if you will. So you might be a little bit upset if you're looking for it for a straightforward open ending, you know, beginning, middle, end. It's very much left up into interpretation. Completionist in me. I was a little bit upset at the ending just because I wanted like I wanted to like I wanted to know what exactly happened uh, and not just be kind of oh here make up your own mind make up your own story uh, but other than that like I said absolutely wonderful art or just wonderful piece beautiful art uh, it's, I can't recommend this book enough if you're willing to put in the time this is one of the best books I've written I honestly this is probably one of the best comics I've ever Read, or, uh, willing to put in the time, this is honestly probably one of the best books you can read. Uh, it's definitely up there, book of the year for me. I don't know, book of my life so far. It, it's a fen phenomenal comic. It, it goes so much more above what comics can be, and I, I hope we, I hope maybe this starts something where we start getting a little bit things a little bit more into this nature, more than just superheroes, monsters, that type of thing. Um, just beautiful book. Yeah, I think it's only like. 16 bucks on Amazon. So if you guys haven't, or if you have any interest in it at all, make sure you pick up a copy. Uh, you won't be disappointed, trust me. Yeah, sorry to get like so personal and sappy on that one, my very first one, but no, I really wanna thank you guys so much for checking out these videos. It really does mean a lot to me that you guys are watching them. I think I'm gonna have a ton of fun doing uh, this pool list. I 
Yeah, I'm just I'm really excited about it. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. I love reading comic books. I love talking about them. So this is like the kind of the perfect release for me in, of, in that kind of standpoint. So yeah, let me know in the comments what you guys thought about this issue. Let me know if you guys are reading any of the books that are reviewed. Let me know if there's anything you guys would like to see reviewed. Um, I love any sort of suggestions. I have quite a few trades all lined up for the next couple weeks. Next week should be a little bit heavier on my normal books. So hopefully I have a little bit more to talk there. Uh, thank you guys so much for checking out these videos. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I have a couple more action figures. I should be doing one actually hopefully today. The pop vinyl I want to review. And guess what? I just got a early release notice from Sideshow Collectibles on my Doctor Strange Hot Toy. So it's going to be charging next Wednesday. So I should have it the following Tuesday. So expect a video review of the Hot Toys Doctor Strange action figure uh, very soon. So that's going to do it for me. I want to thank you guys once again so much for watching. It really means a lot. Sorry I'm so sappy. But I probably won't be reading another book like that. So, so all the next ones will be a lot more fun. So, all right, guys. Thanks so much. I'll check you guys later. See ya.